Good morning, everyone. So being a creature of habit, even though it is a little rainy out and people might be a little late, I'm going to start at 8.01. So in rounds, uh, it's a classic fall morning in Wisconsin. And if you have tender plants, be sure you bring them in tonight. So that's my little meteorological statement that I always make something about at Grand Rounds. So we are, uh, again, the other thing I always say is thank you. Thank you for spending an hour to learn with us in the Department of Medicine and just broaden uh, the horizons about what you know in medicine. It's just a great opportunity. So today we have one of our really incredibly talented faculty presenting grand rounds. And you'll see when I talk about her honors that she really is one of the people in our department that is one of the people who is, who is a true triple threat. So today we have Dr. Dawn Davis, who is MD, PhD. Her talk is about, it's a small world after all, exciting discoveries in intra islet pancreat, pancreatic hormone signaling. She's an associate professor with us in the Division of Endocrine, Diabetes, and Metabolism in the Department of Medicine. So a little bit about Dr. Davis. Dr. Davis did her MD, PhD at University of Chicago. She did her PhD in the Department of Pathology and her MD at Pritzker School of Medicine. She then traveled to the West Coast and she did her internal medicine residency in the research pathway at University of Washington. And we were lucky enough to have her come and join us here at uh, University of Wisconsin for her fellowship in endocrine diabetes and metabolism. She joined us on the faculty right when she finished uh, with, her, with her fellowship, and she was promoted to associate professor in 2016. She has several leadership positions in the Division of Endocrinology. She's the section lead, chief of endocrine here at the VA. She's the co-director of the integrated program in endocrinology, and she is the director of research for the endocrine division. So really uh, fantastic leadership roles. Dr. Davis has 11 active grants at this time, uh, including an R01 in the area of um, pancreatic islet cells, one of the areas she's going to be talking about today. She has 29 papers, and she has mentored, I think, you know, when I counted, 60 mentees at all levels across campus, which is just fantastic. So I talked, you know, I always like to look at uh, what makes people unique in their CVs. And so I'm just going to highlight uh, some of Dr. Davis's awards, three of them that I think are a representative of who she is. She received the Pusto Research Award in 2015, which is the coveted award that we give junior faculty members in the Department of Medicine who have made a significant research contribution to medicine. Hey, Clint, there. Um, uh, Drilling outside the door. Thank you. Um, in 2013, is, is, is a sign of the, her patient care. She received the UW Health Patient Experience Physician Champion Award, again given to the top 5% of our physicians at UW Health for physician satisfaction. And in 2005, at University of Washington, she received the Hutsby Award, which was to a resident who most exemplified integrity, compassion, and excellence in teaching and clinical work. So with that, Dr. Davis, come on up. And we're going to try and get them to stop drilling. OK, thank you so much for the generous introduction. And I'm excited to be here. I actually um, presented in Grand Rounds not that long ago, but it was on a completely different topic. So hopefully, I can keep you guys interested and excited in what I have to talk about today. Um, so I hope I didn't put an earworm in everyone's ear with my title. It's a small world after all, so hopefully you won't be singing that for the rest of the day. It was probably in my head because I'm taking my kids to Disney World next week, so, and I was trying to think of something creative. But what I'm going to talk to you guys about today is, um, you know, what we've really discovered over the last 10 years or so, not just in my lab, but in the um, field of diabetes and islet biology in general, that there's a whole lot going on in the very small world of the pancreatic islet that is um, you know, different than the concepts we've had for a long time about endocrine signaling throughout the whole body related to islet hormones. All right, um, and these are the learning objectives for today. I'm not going to read them out loud to you, um, but you know, my goal is to just give you guys some basic understanding of islet biology and some of this really new, exciting data. And then I'm hoping that through this talk, you can understand a little more about how basic research we do in, um, uh, impacts clinical care and informs us on how the medications we use every day actually work. 
And hopefully this drilling doesn't drive everyone insane by the end of the hour. Okay, so diabetes is a national epidemic. This is the disease that I focus most of my work on and um, for good reason because it currently impacts over 9% of the U.S. population, including around 21 million patients with type 1 diabetes in the United States, um, and an additional 8 million who are unrecognized or undiagnosed diabetes. Um, and so it also takes a significant toll both on our uh, social and economic structure in this country and across the world. Uh, total costs for diabetes uh, related to care, including lost wages and lost work, is over $245 billion, with a B, dollars every single year in this country. And um, patients who have diabetes spend twice as much on medical care than uh, patients without diabetes. And unfortunately, patients with diabetes still have a 50% increased risk of death compared to a non-diabetic patient of the same age. <clears throat> so we obviously have a mission to try to improve the care of patients with diabetes and to um, reduce some of that burden. And so part of that is around prevention, and we'll talk a little bit about that today, but part of it obviously is also around treatment once we have patients with the disease. And the treatment of diabetes has really um, taken off in the last uh, decade or so. We have a, a pretty broad toolbox of uh, medications and treatments that we can use now for diabetes, including at least 14 different classes of drugs um, available for type 2 diabetes. And several of these classes are new within the last uh, decade or so. Um, however, unfortunately, I'd say a personalized medicine approach for uh, diabetes is lagging behind some other diseases in that it's really the, the current uh, guidelines and algorithms of how to treat patients with type 2 diabetes really have a long list of, you know, essentially use any one of these 10 agents as your second line therapy. And there's not a lot of guidance in terms of who's most likely to respond to a specific drug. Um, and part of that is the challenge that although we think we understand how these drugs work, and I teach uh, medical students how these drugs work. I think there's a little more complexity to how many of these medications work than we truly understand. And that's a little bit of what we're going to touch on today. Okay, so then the other main thing that, you know, my lab is focused on is um, pancreatic beta cell mass. So basically the um, number of beta cells you have and their ability to produce insulin is critical in whether or not someone's going to develop diabetes. Uh, we know that reduced beta cell mass is a function of, or is a feature of type 2 diabetes. Um, these are uh, autopsy specimens from patients here without diabetes compared to patients with diabetes, and you can see that overall there's a reduction in the number of beta cells. So while we've known for a long time, obviously, that type 1 diabetes is caused by the loss of pancreatic beta cells, it's also true that type 2 diabetes is caused by the loss of pancreatic beta cells. So one of our goals is to try to prevent that loss and then ultimately restore beta cells in patients who've already developed the disease. And one of the reasons that patients with type 2 diabetes have reduced beta cell mass is because they have an increase in beta cell death. This is again autopsy data showing that patients with type 2 diabetes, whether they're lean or obese, have increased rates of apoptosis or cell death in their uh, pancreatic beta cells. So the goal of diabetes prevention, or the goal of diabetes prevention, in other words, how can we try to prevent these patients with prediabetes, that 81 million people with prediabetes from moving into the category of type 2 diabetes, the goal there is to try to preserve whatever functional beta cell mass they have remaining and prevent the ongoing loss through apoptosis to lead to diabetes. Whereas our goal for diabetes therapy really is to restore functional beta cell mass rather than to just treat the symptom of hyperglycemia. But unfortunately, none of our current therapies for type 2 diabetes actually directly target functional beta cell mass um, in a way that uh, at least has been clinically documented. The one that's probably the closest uh, is uh, the hormone called GLP-1. So we'll talk about GLP-1 a little bit. There's a whole bunch of drugs based around this hormone, GLP-1. So many of you, I think, already know about GLP-1. It's a peptide hormone um, that has many positive benefits for diabetes. It's um, classically a normal physiology. It's understood to be produced in the neuroendocrine cells of the gut in response to food intake, and then circulates through the bloodstream to impact tissues uh, in multiple different tissues as a classic endocrine hormone. It's primarily known to be responsible for what we call the incretin effect. The incretin effect is the 
concept that when we eat food through our mouth, it stimulates the production of these hormones from the gut that then go on to stimulate insulin secretion. Whereas if we in, instead infuse glucose directly through an IV and we bypass the gut, we lose that effect of this gut hormone production that stimulates insulin secretion. And this is one of the reasons why those of you who are uh, working clinically know that when you put a patient on IV glucose or something in the hospital that they're much more likely to have hyperglycemia than if they're just eating normally. Um, and then the other thing about GLP-1 is that it, um, it you know, as a, a potentially really good target for diabetes therapy, the challenge around GLP-1 is that it's, uh, the normal physiologic production uh, leads to, is rapidly broken down in the circulating bloodstream. So the peptide hormone in and of itself is not a good drug, uh, drug target. Um, and the reason it's rapidly broken down is because this enzyme called DPP-4, also dipeptidyl peptidase 4, uh, it cleaves two amino acids off of GLP-1 to rapidly turn it into the inactive form. And this uh, activity of DPP-4 basically inactivates over 80% of the GLP-1 pool in the plasma within five minutes of secretion from the gut. So this GLP-1 doesn't hang around long. It's a really quick on, quick off type of hormone. So when people wanted to try to develop a drug to uh, mimic GLP-1, they really had to come up with something that was a modification of the native GLP-1 peptide hormone. And I like to tell this story because I think it just um, highlights why we need to continue to study all these random things that you think have no meaning. Someone out there was studying Gila monster saliva for some reason, <laughs> um, hopefully funded by the National Science Foundation or something. And characterized all of the naturally occurring hormones in Gila monster saliva. And one of those hormones happened to be exendin, which was very similar in structure to GLP-1 that we make as humans. And so ultimately, what they found is that exendin is resistant to cleavage by that DPP-4 enzyme, so it has a much longer half-life in circulation than GLP-1, and this exendin Gila monster hormone was essentially turned into the first drug in class for GLP-1 receptor agonists called exenatide or bieta. And since then, there's been a large number of drugs that have been um, brought to market, similarly working on various modifications of the native GLP-1 uh, peptide hormone to increase its uh, half-life and circulation. Um, these include uh, modifications to the peptide itself or the addition of uh, fatty acyl groups or albumin groups um, to try to, in, again, enable it to be resistant to DPP-4 cleavage. And these drugs have really taken off. They're used in, uh, very frequently in the treatment of patients with type 2 diabetes in this country um, and have a lot of positive benefits. And so we think, again, that these drugs are kind of mimicking what happens normally with GLP-1, but the main difference is that this would be a sustained long-term increase in GLP-1 uh, circulating in the bloodstream rather than the quick on, quick off that we have in normal physiology. The other class of drugs that's relevant here is the DPP-4 inhibitor. So I already explained to you what DPP-4 does. So uh, um, drugs have been developed that inhibit that DPP-4 enzyme and thereby allow the GLP-1 that you make naturally in response to food intake to not be cleaved and to last much longer. So this leads to an increase in circulating GLP-1 levels in the blood, and these are the four drugs on market right now that um, are DPP-4 inhibitors. Also used quite widely in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. So everything I told you already is essentially what the textbooks say and what we teach, but there's been some questions, I think, brought up through numerous people in the field. This is a, uh, an opinion article written by Dave D'Alessio a couple years ago. He actually came and gave our Department of Medicine Research Day keynote talk and talked a little bit about this at that time. Um, and what people have questioned is, does GLP-1 under normal physiologic conditions actually work as we think? Um, is it really an endocrine hormone? And the reason that that's been questioned is partly what I've already explained to you, that it's rapidly degraded, um, and so can it even get from the neuroendocrine cells in the gut all the way to distal tissues to signal and cause sustained effects when it's only in the circulation for less than a minute or two? Um, in addition, this is just showing you the actual levels of GLP-1 after, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that's not actually projecting, is it? Um, the actual levels of GLP-1 after a meal 
And you can see they go up, but very slightly, and we're still in the low picomolar range for GLP-1 in the circulation, even after a meal, and then we're basically back to an almost zero baseline within an hour or so. Whereas this other incretin hormone, GIP, also secreted from the gut, has much higher circulating levels in, um, in the post-meal uh, time frame. And so the question is maybe GIP is actually the more predominant incretin hormone than GLP-1. And then the second uh, bullet point here is that, um, interestingly, if we inhibit GLP-1 signaling by using an antagonist to the GLP-1 receptor, we not only, as you would expect, reduce the uh, insulin secretion in the fed state, in other words, after a patient eats, um, their glucose is high and their GLP-1 should go up, we block that GLP-1 and we don't get as much insulin secretion as we otherwise would. This was the expected result. What was unexpected is that if we um, block GLP-1 signaling in the fasting state when glucose is normal and GLP-1 in the circulation is incredibly low, we also inhibit fasting insulin secretion. And so this suggests that there's some GLP-1 signaling occurring in the fasting state that is not even um, due to circulating GLP-1 in the circulation. So what this tells us is that maybe there's other GLP-1 in the body that's signaling in an important way to stimulate insulin secretion even when there's none in the peripheral blood. And part of what could explain a little bit of also how DPP-4 inhibitors actually work is that not only do they inhibit GLP-1, um, as we talked about, but they also, in, um, normally, uh, DPP-4 will cleave and inactivate that other peptide hormone, GIP. And so when you treat a patient with DPP-4 inhibitors, they have an increase in both GLP-1 and GIP in the circulation. And so it could be the combination of these two that actually drives the effect of these DPP-4 inhibitors. Okay, so that's kind of the, the background, I guess, on the clinical side. Now we're going to kind of jump in to the basic science part of the talk and, and really come honing into what I'm calling the small world of islet biology. So the classic focus of islet biology really has been around this concept that, you know, an, a pancreatic islet is made up of predominantly two cells. We've really focused on these two cells over the years, the beta cells, which produce insulin, that lowers blood glucose and the alpha cells that produce glucagon, which raises blood glucose. And it's, you know, been studied as this kind of classic yin-yang thing when there's uh, beta cells making insulin, then that's um, going to be in the postprandial state, whereas the alpha cells will make glucagon in the fasting state. But it's really a lot more complex than this simplistic idea that really has been the focus. And in fact, the islet makes many other hormones and signaling molecules beyond just insulin and glucagon. Um, we have known certainly for a long time that there are specific cells within the islet that make hormones, including somatostatin, which is an overall inhibitory hormone. It inhibits both insulin and glucagon. Um, ghrelin and pancreatic polypeptide are made in distinct cell types within the islet. But even more interesting is that a number of other signaling molecules and hormones that many of you have probably heard of and never thought were made in an islet are actually made in the pancreatic islet by the same cells that are making insulin and glucagon. So serotonin, GABA, acetylcholine are all made in alpha and beta cells. Uh, neuropeptide Y, GLP-1, CCK, and gastrin, these are classic gut peptide hormones, are made in alpha and beta cells. And then the, anti, or the inflammatory uh, interleukin-6 is made in alpha cells in the islet. And we're going to touch a little bit on, on several of these today, but mostly our talk's going to focus on the GLP-1 and CCK story. So really, this has brought us to this much more complex view of the pancreatic islet, that there are not only alpha and beta cells, but there are other cell types that uniquely produce other hormones, and that these alpha and beta cells co-secrete other hormones in addition to insulin and glucagon. And exactly how this is happening is still um, a, you know, a work in progress. Are these alpha and beta cells either de-differentiating or trans-differentiating to, <clears throat> excuse me, to make other, cell, other hormones? Um, or is this islet hormone production changing in response to an external stressor or in the setting of diabetes and hyperglycemia? Um, and that's all part of what's ongoing work in our field. <clears throat> so, I'm going to talk a bit today about paracrine signaling, so I thought I would define this term for you. 
So again, I'm an endocrinologist. So endocrinologists, we focus on endocrine hormones. And um, endocrine essentially means a hormone that's produced in one cell type released into the circulation and then has its action on a distal receptor on a different tissue in the body. It's circulating um, um, through the bloodstream. Paracrine signaling, on the other hand, is um, something similar to what we show here, where you have a release of a hormone from a specific cell, in this case within the islet, in response to some stimulus. And then that hormone acts on a receptor in a neighboring cell um, to elicit a response in that neighboring cell. And these signals in paracrine signaling don't necessarily go through the vasculature, and they certainly don't necessarily go through the peripheral vasculature. They may go through local capillary beds, or they may even be signaling just through the extracellular space itself. So I talked a lot at the beginning about GLP-1 and how it's classically understood to be made in the gut uh, in response to food intake, but what um, has been discovered both by our lab and others over the last 10 years or so is that GLP-1 is also can be made in the alpha cells within the pancreas. And in some ways this really shouldn't have surprised us because um, GLP-1 is actually a product of the proglucagon peptide. So when uh, the glucagon gene is transcribed and translated, it forms a proglucagon peptide here that normally in an alpha cell is cleaved by prohormone convertase 2 to release the peptide hormone glucagon. However, in a neuroendocrine cell in the gut, it would pr express prohormone convertase 1, which would cleave GLP-1 specifically out of this propeptide. So you can imagine an alpha cell within the pancreas has a ton of this proglucagon um, pro, uh, peptide here, and as it expresses any PCSK13, it will release a small amount of GLP-1. Um, so this is how GLP-1 is expressed in the alpha cell, and other groups had shown previously that this uh, expression of GLP-1 is enhanced or increased in the setting of various stressors, including pregnancy, which is a stressor because it induces an insulin-resistant state and drives the cells to make more insulin. So we have gone on to show that um, GLP-1 is produced in the islets um, and specifically more in response to obesity. Um, in mice, we show that there's an increased amount of GLP-1 secreted from islets in the obese mouse as compared to their lean counterparts. Although even lean mice express GL and secrete some GLP-1. And in human islets, we actually see a lot of GLP-1 production. If you look at the scale here, we're in the hundreds of picomolar range as opposed to the tens of picomolar range over here. And in humans also, these are um, human islets from deceased organ donors, and we see that as a function of the BMI of the donor, there's even more GLP-1 in the obese donors than there is in the lean donors. So for many years, this was thought to be kind of a, almost a, an error or a mistake that some GLP-1 is occasionally made in those alpha cells due to that um, processing of that prohormone, as we discussed. And it was thought to be a relatively rare thing. Maybe a few alpha cells here and there might make GLP-1. So this is some uh, newer data from our lab where we actually decided to go and quantify this because we were surprised by how much active GLP-1 we were seeing secreted from these islets. We wanted to know how many alpha cells are actually producing GLP-1. So this is just quantification of both mouse and human islets. And you can see, first of all, human islets have a lot more alpha cells in the first place than a mouse islet. Um, around 30% of the human islet cells are alpha cells. But um, if we look over here, you see that over um, 60, almost 70 percent of the human alpha cells co-express GLP-1. Um, and even though there's a lot fewer in the mouse of the alpha cells that are there, almost 50 percent of them co-express GLP-1. So this is not a rare phenomenon. This is not something unusual. And these are lean, unstressed islets um, where we think that, again, in obese or stress situations, these numbers may go up even more. So what's regulating this expression of GLP-1 in the alpha cell? There's a few things that I'll just briefly touch on because I think it brings us back to the, the original story I was telling that um, one of the things that is known to increase the expression of GLP-1 in the alpha cell is that same gut peptide hormone we talked about earlier, GIP. GIP treatment leads to an increase in GLP-1 um, as well as a IL-6 from the pancreatic islet. And so this is uh, not our data, but um, from Mark Donath, and he showed that 
In fact, the model is that GIP, probably coming from the circulation, stimulates the release of IL-6 from the alpha cell, which then further stimulates the release of GLP-1 from other alpha cells. And then that GLP-1 has local impacts on insulin secretion, which we'll talk about next. And let me just go back one second and mention here then, so again, as we talked about at the beginning, those DPP-4 inhibitors increase circulating GIP, so you can imagine that they may also drive this process to occur more um, frequently in the pancreatic islets in a patient who's taking a DPP-4 inhibitor. <clears throat> and then this is a really elegant paper um, from Darlene Sandoval at Michigan where she tried to essentially test the model of where is this uh, GLP-1 coming from that's the most important in the regulation of glucose metabolism. So she essentially knocked out that proglucagon gene and then added it back in specific tissues. And so when you add it back in the gut, um, these uh, mice now can't make GLP-1 in their alpha cells, and um, if you block signaling through the GLP-1 receptor, it actually has no effect on glucose tolerance in these mice, suggesting that while there's still GLP-1 being made from the gut, it's not critical for normal glucose tolerance in these mice. Whereas if you um, restore GLP-1 only in the pancreatic islet, now you block that GLP-1 signaling and you do get impairment of glucose tolerance, suggesting again that this paracrine signaling of GLP-1 is critical for normal glucose homeostasis. Um, and it's not actually the GLP-1 coming from the gut that's as critical. And we've gone on to confirm this in a little bit um, a smaller way, I guess, so that we took isolated pancreatic islets. Again, we see that both mouse and human islets secrete GLP-1 um, into the tissue culture media. After culture for 24 or 72 hours, there's quite a bit of GLP-1 produced. And if we then take these islets and um, test their ability to secrete insulin, um, what we show over here is that in, under low glucose conditions, three millimolar glucose, which is basically hypoglycemia, um, there's very little insulin secretion. But if you increase glucose concentrations to 15 millimolar, which is around 250 mil, uh, milligrams per deciliter or so, there's a stimulation of insulin secretion, as you would expect. This is glucose-stimulated insulin secretion. Interestingly, though, if you now take uh, that exendin 9, which is the GLP-1 receptor antagonist, so you're blocking the ability of GLP-1 to signal, we're not adding GLP-1, the GLP-1 is coming from the islets itself, we now inhibit the ability of those islets to produce insulin. So what this tells us is that this intra-islet production and signaling of GLP-1 is essential for normal glucose-stimulated insulin secretion. Um, and so essentially we have shown in others that GLP-1 is a paracrine signal within the islet. It's produced from the alpha cell to signal on the neighboring uh, beta cells uh, where it can stimulate insulin secretion. And then later in the talk we're going to discuss some of the other effects it also has on the beta cells. And we think that this paracrine signaling may explain some of the impacts of the effects of diabetes therapies, including those DPP-4 inhibitors. Um, because it may be activating and prolonging the activity of GLP-1 in this local paracrine environment. Okay, so now moving back to the beta cell mass question, which we talked about at the beginning. So um, while my lab does study insulin secretion at some level, we've predominantly been focused on restoring and maintaining beta cell mass. So one of the things that's already been known about GLP-1, in addition to its ability to stimulate insulin secretion, is that it can also protect beta cells from apoptosis through action through its receptor. Um, and these are just multiple downstream pathways that um, a GLP-1 receptor signaling can activate to prevent beta cell death. So we've known that already for a long time, and we're going to talk now over the next group of slides about um, how GLP-1 may be doing this also in combination with another hormone that's kind of the favorite hormone in my lab, cholecystokinin. So cholecystokinin, I'm going to call this CCK, is a hormone that most of you, if you even remember it at all, maybe you read one line about it in a textbook once upon a time, but you don't think about this in your normal daily work or in your normal daily clinical um, consideration. CCK, however, is an important hormone. It is produced also in the gut uh, neuroendocrine cells in response to food intake. 
It also can be produced within the brain and signal locally within the brain. Um, it's released into the circulation and has many of the same effects as these other incretin hormones in that it stimulates satiety, makes you feel full and eat less. Um, it decreases gastric motility, also makes you feel full and it can stimulate some insulin secretion. Um, the other thing it does though is it aids digestion in other ways. It produces, it causes bile production and gallbladder contraction as well as the production of exocrine pancreas digestive hormones or digestive enzymes. So um, CCK has been studied over the decades as a potential uh, therapeutic agent for both obesity and diabetes due to these effects, but it's really been kind of off to the sidelines in many ways. Um, however, this is some of the older data just to show you that um, uh, if we look at patients who have type 2 diabetes, here we're looking at their response to the intake of a meal. A normal person increases their CCK uh, in the circulation in response to the meal, whereas patients with type 2 diabetes have a blunted production of CCK uh, in the circulation. If you then infuse CCK to patients with type 2 diabetes, Again, the normal type 2 patient has a significant rise in their blood glucose after they eat, whereas if you simultaneously infuse CCK, that glucose rise is blunted. So it improves post-meal glucose, and that's at least partly due to some slight increases in insulin secretion after the meal, although this is a pretty modest effect. And there's been other studies in mice as well showing that CCK can protect mice from obesity. This is looking at mice fed a high-fat diet Normal mice fed a high-fat diet will gain weight and maintain weight gain over the course of that high-fat diet feeding, whereas if you infuse these mice with CCK, they actually don't gain weight and maintain a normal weight compared to their lean, non-high-fat diet fed controls. And those same high-fat diet fed mice normally have impaired glucose tolerance in response to that high-fat diet feeding, but if you, again, give them CCK, they have normal glucose tolerance similar to the child-fed control. So CCK has this potential um, as a therapeutic for diabetes and obesity because it has these positive roles of reducing weight or weight gain, improving glucose tolerance, and improving insulin secretion. But um, what the reason we got interested in CCK is that um, it is actually, again, one of the hormones that's produced within the pancreatic islet somewhat surprisingly. So unlike GLP-1, where it was a little less surprising that an alpha cell might make GLP-1 because it was already making the propeptide, CCK was not thought to be expressed. It's made from a completely distinct gene and protein product than insulin or glucagon. Um, and it was, however, found to be highly upregulated in the islets of mice um, under conditions of obesity. So lean mice make very little CCK in their islets whereas obese mice um, produce quite a bit of CCK, both at the messenger RNA level and at the level of the active um, protein or peptide. And when we look at where the CCK is made, um, these are some images of the mouse islets. In lean mice, red is staining for insulin here, green is a marker of expression of CCK. You can see there's very little CCK expression in these lean mice. But if we look at those obese mice, we see a lot of this green marker of CCK expression. It's in both beta cells and occasionally non-beta cells, but not every single beta cell is making CCK under these conditions. So it's uh, being produced, however, at much higher levels in this scenario. So that's mice. Mice are great, and we love to study mice, but who cares if it happens in mice if it doesn't happen in humans, right? So we then had to go and look, does CCK get expressed in human islets as well? And um, these are, again, uh, deceased organ donor human islets. We have a, a bunch of different preparations here that we looked at, and what we find is that, yes, CCK is produced at the messenger RNA level in these uh, human islets, although the level of CCK expression is highly variable, and in this case does not correlate with obesity or BMI of the donor. It seems to be expressed um, across both lean and obese uh, donors. The uh, CCK is also secreted from human islets here um, under control conditions. The islets produce a small amount of CCK into the media, um, and that CCK can be stimulated by uh, treating the islets with cyclic AMP to activate um, uh, secretion. And importantly, the, C the islets also express the two receptors for CCK, CCK A and B receptor, although again at highly variable levels, sometimes very low, sometimes relatively high levels. <coughs> 
So what this just tells us is that yes, this system is also in place in a human islet, um, not just in the mouse. Um, what regulates CCK expression in the islet? We're still working on this, um, but one of the things that we have shown recently is that high glucose can stimulate the expression of CCK messenger RNA in both mouse and human islets. So we think that hyperglycemia is potentially one of the things that may drive um, expression. So again, we're kind of adding to this idea that in addition to both um, insulin and glucagon, we're also producing these other two hormones in the islet, particularly under conditions of obesity, but probably in humans under even normal lean conditions. So I, if you remember from several slides ago, I showed you that CCK, or that, excuse me, GLP-1 signaling was critical for insulin secretion in the kind of isolated islet. Um, so we wanted to see, does CCK, is CCK critical for insulin secretion? CCK has been shown previously to stimulate insulin secretion when it's infused into an animal or a person. So we wondered, is it necessary for this paracrine signaling? Is that driving insulin secretion, excuse me, in the beta cell? And the uh, answer is no. So unlike GLP-1, when we treat either lean, obese, mouse islets or human islets with this proglumide, which is an inhibitor of both CCK receptors, we don't see any inhibition of insulin secretion in a significant way um, with this proglumide treatment. So basically blocking CCK signaling in the local islet environment does not impair insulin secretion. So CCK must have some other role in the islet. So what is that role? Well, we, um, I'm going to show you over the next several slides that we think it's important in protecting those beta cells from apoptosis and um, promoting beta cell survival. We knocked out CCK in that obese mouse. So remember, the obese mice are the only ones that actually make CCK in their islet. So when we knock CCK out, those obese mice have an impairment in the islet area, the number of beta cells, and they have more beta cell death as well. So that tells us that that locally produced CCK must be having some uh, role in promoting beta cell growth or inhibiting beta cell death. So what we know or knew at this point, I guess, is that CCK is produced in the mouse islet under the stress conditions such as obesity. It's expressed and secreted from human islets, which also increased in high glucose conditions. Paracrine CCK signaling is not necessary for normal insulin secretion, but the loss of CCK leads to an increase in beta cell death. So the next question we asked is, um, is the CCK produced in the islet necessary or important for beta cell survival under different stress conditions? In this experiment, we um, treated mice with uh, streptozytosin, which is a be direct beta cell toxin. It causes beta cell death and apoptosis. And you can see in a wild type mouse in black here that the mice develop hyperglycemia after treatment with streptocytosin. And they have a decreased, um, excuse me, uh, increase in the number of apoptotic beta cells after streptocytosin uh, treatment. However, if we also, uh, if we treat mice with streptocytosin here that have the expression of uh, CCK in the beta cell, we're using a mouse insulin promoter here to drive the expression of CCK specifically in the beta cell. So basically all cells that produce insulin will also produce CCK. Those mice are protected from the effects of this beta cell toxin. They don't develop hyperglycemia and they have a much less beta cell death in response to STZ, suggesting that that locally produced CCK is, um, is important in beta cell survival. We also followed these mice out till they were um, over one year in age, which is kind of late middle age for a mouse, and we showed that they have retention or increased islet area in um, uh, islet size, suggesting again that over the lifespan of the animal, having CCK production in the islet is a benefit in terms of beta cell mass. So that showed us that local production of CCK within that paracrine islet environment can preserve beta cell mass. We now wanted to kind of think more therapeutically, could we treat a mouse with CCK and improve beta cell death or protect beta cells from death? So we first did this in the um, tissue culture dish environment with isolated islets. So we take islets from both mice on this side and human islets on this side and this is kind of a complex slide, so I won't walk you through everything, but the take-home message is essentially that if we have um, 
islets that we treat with cytokine cocktail. In this case, a cytokine cocktail causes inflammation and ultimately beta cell apoptosis and kind of mimics the inflammatory environment of both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Uh, so those cells normally die in response to cytokines. If we treat them with CCK, there's a reduction in the um, percent of cells that are dying uh, in response to cytokines. Um, and that's true both in mouse and in human islet. And um, if we have a mouse that's lacking the CCK receptors, we no longer see the, any protection from CCK, which seems like an obvious experiment, but an important one to show that this is actually working through that CCK receptor signaling pathway. And we've shown this reduction in cell death in human islets from, in two different methods, and we've shown it over time using different types of um, cell stress as well. So then we wanted to kind of do the more um, challenging experiment, I guess, to see can we even, can we protect a human islet in a more um, physiologic system or something that mimics um, human biology a little bit more. And unfortunately, we can't necessarily do these experiments in living people because we don't have a good way to assess whether their beta cells are living or dying after um, we treat them with CCK. So what we do instead is we take human islets, again, from uh, deceased organ donors, we transplant them into an immunodeficient mouse who can then carry those human islets, and we then treated these mice with either CCK or saline control, and they were also diabetic mice, so we um, followed them over two weeks to see, do these human islets survive in the transplanted situation? And what you can see here is that the saline-treated mice had increased levels of beta cells that were dying, whereas the mice treated with CCK had almost no beta cell death. So this gives us a lot of um, potential that CCK treatment could be a way to actually prevent beta cell death in the human islets in a living person. And we actually got some pilot money from the um, transplant surgery department to study this now moving forward in um, uh, using both CCKA and CCKB receptor specific or agonists so that we can determine which CCK signaling pathway is the critical one for the downstream effects. And the reason that's important, again, is because we do have two CCK receptors that uh, can signal CCK um, action, and we want to know which one is driving this pro-survival effect. Because the CCK receptors do have some negative potential impacts, including these GI side effects we talked about, um, possible pancreatitis, et cetera. And so one of the future goals in our lab is to understand <laughs> which specific receptor-mediated signaling pathways promote these positive effects so that we can allow some more targeted drug discovery. And I'll just briefly show you that this is some of the newer data from our lab showing that we think it's actually the CCKA receptor that's critical. If we look at mice that are lacking um, the both receptors, I already showed you, they no longer have the protection from um, cell death. But the B knockout mice, if you're missing the B, knock, the B receptor, you still have protection from uh, beta cell apoptosis. So that suggests the B receptor is not critical. But the A receptor knockout mice um, fail to protect, suggesting that the A receptor is the critical one, at least in mice, for mediating this effect. Okay, so in the last few minutes, um, I'll try to wrap up with a few slides talking a little bit more, bringing us back to this whole GLP-1 story. So we have asked over the years what regulates this dramatic increase of CCK in the setting of obesity. We knew from other um, studies in other cells that CCK could be regulated through cyclic AMP signaling. It has a specific cyclic AMP response element in its promoter. So we asked, is it regulated by cyclic AMP in beta cells? And one of the reasons we were interested in this is because, uh, I showed you this slide already, GLP-1 is this peptide hormone that also signals through cyclic AMP within the beta cell. So we wondered, okay, yes, first of all, the answer is CCK can stimulate, um, or excuse me, cyclic AMP can stimulate CCK expression in the islet and secretion. Um, and so we then said, can GLP-1 do it all by itself? And the answer is yes. So if we treat islets with GLP-1, they increase the expression of CCK, mRNA, and um, secretion of the full peptide. Um, and so this kind of brings us to this paracrine signaling pathway within the islet that we um, have discovered, which is that we think GLP-1 either produced from a neighboring alpha cell locally or 
being given potentially as a drug, as a GLP-1 receptor agonist, or because there's increased circulating GLP-1 from treatment with a DPP-4 inhibitor can then stimulate beta cells to produce an increasing amount of CCK that feeds back and acts on CCKA receptors in the beta cell to protect from apoptosis. So we, this is a little bit of a complex experiment, but what we wanted to do next is say, okay, we know GLP-1 on its own can protect from apoptosis. Does the ability of GLP-1 to protect beta cells from death depend on its ability to stimulate CCK production? So in this experiment, we basically treated those islets again. We'll just focus on this one over here. When you treat them with cytokines, you get an increase in cell death. When you treat them with GLP-1 plus cytokines, you prevent that cell death. But if you now add a CCK receptor antagonist, you block CCK signaling, the GLP-1 is no longer as effective at reducing beta cell death. This is shown in a couple different methods here. And this tells us that the um, ab ability for GLP-1 to block uh, or to inhibit apoptosis is at least partially dependent on its ability to make, to stimulate that production of CCK, which then goes on in its own way to inhibit apoptosis. So in other words, both the GLP-1 drug classes and GLP-1 local production itself may depend on the ability of those beta cells to make CCK. All right, I think I have enough time to do these last couple slides. So um, the last thing I wanted to bring up is, again, a little bit of a different story. I showed you this slide before. Um, I showed you how GIP can stimulate GLP-1. Um, and it does this through the production of interleukin-6 from the alpha cell. So in my lab previously, we have shown that IL-6, although many people think of this as a negative thing, it's an inflammatory cytokine, we've actually shown that IL-6 can uh, lead to a reduction in beta cell death in response to cytokines. So basically, IL-6 is also protective at a similar level to GLP-1. Um, and this, through many other experiments that I don't have time to go through, we showed that the way IL-6 does this is by in, uh, stimulating autophagy uh, in the beta cell. But the important point here, I think, is that IL-6 is another locally produced hormone that can also protect beta cells from cell death. So this whole um, picture really has developed of this complex intra-islet signaling network, paracrine network, that promotes beta cell survival. And um, I'll just walk you through this briefly. We've kind of talked through all these things already, but we talked about how GLP-1 and CCK production is important. In addition, we mentioned that GIP is produced in the gut and is at relatively high levels in the circulation post-meal, but also in patients treated with DPP-4 inhibitors, and can signal to increase GLP-1 production as well as IL-6 production from the alpha cell which then can go on to inhibit apoptosis in these multiple ways. So we think all of these pathways are really working together to promote beta cell survival, prevent beta cell apoptosis, and if we can find different ways to turn these pathways on, both through the drugs we already have and maybe new drugs that we can develop, we hope that we can, again, allow patients to maintain normal functional insulin secretion for longer and have uh, better outcomes in terms of their diabetes. Okay, and then the last slide here, I just need to thank all the people who do all this hard work every day. Um, this is a relatively recent picture of my current lab, um, and I'll just highlight the data that I showed you, the unpublished data today was primarily from Hung Tae Kim, who's a graduate student in my lab, and Arnaldo D'Souza, a postdoc in my lab, um, both of whom have papers coming out on a lot of that data. And then uh, these are former um, either MD or postdoc fellows in my lab who did a lot of the work on the earlier CCK studies, including Amelia Lindemann, Carly Kibbe, and Jeremy Levine, and all of them have gone on to faculty positions at other institutions. And definitely want to thank all my funding sources, including um, support from this department and from the Wisconsin Partnership Program. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. <laughs> Sam.
That's a good question. So the, uh, I'm supposed to repeat the question. <laughs> so the question was, um, because DPV4 inhibitors can actually increase both GIP and GLP-1, would I be more likely to use those for type 2 diabetes than a GLP-1 receptor agonist itself? Um, to be honest, the answer is no, and that's partly just because the, G the DPV4 inhibitors clinically are less effective than the GLP-1 receptor agonists. They lower blood glucose, but not as much um, as GLP-1 receptor agonists, and that's probably at least partly due to the effects that the GLP-1 receptor agonists have on um, uh, weight loss as well, and we don't see the weight loss with the DPP-4 inhibitors. I don't know why we don't see the weight loss with the DPP-4 inhibitors. Theoretically, we should have, but we don't. So um, that's another bit of a mystery in terms of why they don't work as effectively as we'd like them to. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, it is a bit of a concern. I mean, I um, kind of just touched on that story at the very end, and, and a lot of that project's been taken over by um, my former postdoc, Amelia Lindemann, who's now at Indiana University, but she um, has been looking at that even more broadly at uh, IL-6 uh, um, IL antibodies and also at uh, uh, mice lacking the IL-6 receptor in the beta cell to see what impact that has. And so the answer is yes. I mean, it does look like potentially that would have a negative impact on beta cell survival under certain conditions. But IL-6 is, you know, you know, the reason we block it or inhibit it is because it's generally thought to be a bad thing. Um, and in, at least in this particular situation, it seems to have a positive benefit. So there's kind of this yin-yang with IL-6. Is it good or bad? And probably depends on the tissue and the overall situation um, of what signaling pathways are activated. Okay. Oh, yeah, one more question. Yep. Um, one of the things that we've always uh, experienced in diabetes is that uh, a lot of times the numbers improve, the blood sugars improve, the A1C percentages improve. Are these newer drugs, uh, but, but we haven't seen as much impact on neuropathies, nephropathies, vasculopathy. Are these newer drugs, I, I, I don't know the data, are, mm -hmm. are they really showing a huge impact on the consequences of diabetes, not just the, the glucose levels? Yeah, um, so the question was, um, you know, do these newer drugs that we talked about today, the GLP-1 receptor agonists and DPP-4 inhibitors specifically, um, do they have impacts beyond lowering glucose? Do they actually protect from complications of diabetes? Um, so actually the, uh, the GLP-1 receptor agonists, yes, they do. And the, they're actually uh, now two of them that are actually specifically FDA approved for the reduction in cardiovascular events um, in patients with diabetes. So. How they do that is a little bit unclear, but GLP-1 um, does signal through the heart and through the vasculature, so there's some concept that maybe it's working independent of its effect on glucose control to have a positive benefit for cardiovascular outcomes. Um, and then there's some data with some of the other drugs, including the SGLT2 inhibitors, that they also pr protect against the progression of kidney disease in patients with type 2 diabetes. Um, and so, but those are mostly thought to be distinct mechanisms from the way they're lowering glucose. So it's kind of a complex situation and um, we don't fully understand how they work and, but they are now gaining like actual FDA indications for those protective effects in patients with diabetes.